time and get them and, uh, uh, and so on. So take advantage of your visits as much as possible. Um, uh, in, in, the, in his essay uh, against poetry, uh, the contemporary Polish poet uh, Adam Zagajewski um, answers a series of common criticisms of poetry uh, throughout his long history. Uh, that uh, it's a form of frivolous self-expression practiced by amateurs. Uh, and it is obsessed uh, with so-called inspiration and likewise obsessed with melancholy. Uh, that the imagination is crippled by theory, and uh, poetry is helpless before ontological elements of reality, um, all of which he acknowledges is true and then carefully dismantles those arguments against poetry uh, before he concludes that poetry must not cede any ground uh, to other intellectual enterprises, particularly history and philosophy. And in fact, uh, Zagajewski insists that poetry, like history and philosophy, must engage in central intellectual labors of its era. In our case, uh, that is, how to confront and answer evil, particularly the evil of the 20th century, which still haunts our lives. And he points out that this has been exactly the work of our greatest poets from Shakespeare and Goethe and Rilke uh, through the 20th century, Anna Akhmatova, Al Salan, uh, W.H. Allen, he mentions, and then two of his most famous uh, uh, countrymen, uh, the poets, Zbigniew Herbert and Czesław Miłosz, uh, who is a Nobel laureate, who spoke here in an Ars Poetica lecture in 1983. And it just so happens that those last uh, two writers, Herbert and Milos, uh, are writers to whom John Davis is sometimes compared, which is uh, a heady piece of praise. Uh, and that comparison is due precisely because of how John Davis takes on uh, what Zagajewski calls the intellectual labors of the time. Uh, he cedes nothing to philosophy and history. And um, uh, what we think of today uh, as the banality of evil, uh, our casual violence, uh, moral catastrophes of modern life, psychological numbness, our so-called uh, uh, consumer culture, uh, all of these um, things that bombard us daily are the things to which uh, John Davis often turns his attention. Um, it's fitting, too, uh, that John has accomplished such a difficult task uh, as this in his uh, two most recent books, The Scrimmage of Appetite, uh, which uh, then uh, poet laureate uh, Robert Hodge called on Terry Gross's uh, uh, fresh air uh, to reluctantly uh, say, I don't, I don't want to talk about any contemporary American writers. There is one. There is a book I just read by a guy named John Davis. I have no idea who he is, but it's the best book by a guy and writer I've read maybe ever. It's wonderful. Um, again, that, that's some great praise. Um, and his new collection, which he'll be uh, I think, focusing on tonight, is a preliminary report. And in both of these, uh, he creates poems of great intelligence and vigor. Uh, sometimes, deeply satirical grain, uh, and others uh, uh, deeply tender and humane. Years ago, John Davis began agitating for a new American poetry characterized by aesthetic seriousness, imaginative excellence, uh, by ambition and risk-taking, and failing perhaps to have created a movement to follow him is nonetheless uh, accomplished exactly that. So please uh, join me in welcoming my friend, uh, John Davis. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to th thank all of you for coming. I, I expected maybe a little smattering of people in the front of the room. And we have a full room. Can you hear me back there? 
Pretty, okay. Uh, and I want to thank David and Jody for inviting me out here. Um, it's really great to see them. Um, haven't seen them in a while and catch up on a lot of years. And, uh, and you students who take courses from them are really lucky. I mean, the, you, uh, you have an example. My old, uh, our old teachers say that the creative writing workshop was the last place you could go where your life still matters. And being in David's class today, I thought, yeah, that's, that's still true. Um, that you can go in there and your life, everything that, you know, your entire life has a meaning um, that it might not have elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you're lucky. In class today, we, um, <clears throat> I want to thank Taryn and Will before we go further um, for, this, for setting this room up so beautifully and for miking me <laughs> numerous times. Uh, and the people in class today who had great questions. I'm going to um, read for a while and then we have a special guest. Should I, like, total, if I do a total of an hour with the other guy? A little less? A little less. All right. Poets should never ask that because the audience always says yes and they don't really mean yes. They <laughs> so we'll, we'll go a little under that. Okay, so let's start with uh, uh, a political poem called The New Americans. I read this in class today, but I like to start off with it, at least partly because I like the sound of it. And it, uh, when, you're read, when you're doing a reading, it's always good to start with a poem that you like the sound of. The New Americans. Oh, I should say, um, it's based on the, the painting that's the cover of this book, which is a frog with a human hand. So I wanted to understand what sort of human beings were evolving from this frog, and I wrote the poem. They are rising from duckweed shoals on slippery haunches, front feet changed into grasping hands, thumb and forearms thickened for commerce, mouths too bony for kissing. They will breathe through their skins. Their eyes will be keen for motion. They will be maculate, stricken with appetite. They will lunge with purpose, long tongue speaking the language of capture, shouting the single verb of longing in the dialect of hunger. They will grunt and snore nightly in the tall grass, while gods made in their image bellow beside the river of heaven, they will jockey in the weed banks. They will turn nothing human in their eyes, just the hard measure, the precision, the unswerving focus. They will be mystics wired to the God's wishes. They will leap before they know they are leaping. And this poem um, is part of a 42-page sequence, the other 41 pages of which I will spare you. Uh, but <laughs> I think it stands on its own. Uh, it, uh, it refers to Maximus in the first line. Maximus is the nickname of the poet Charles Olson, um, and I quote him in the opening section. You don't need to know anything else about Maximus or Charles Olson for the poem to make sense. Um, I read this at one of those Poets Against the War um, readings, and a lot of people said, um, how is it a poem against the war? And, um, but, I, but I insist that it is. It's called An American. An American, Maximus wrote, is a complex of occasions. And occasion, he would have known this, means to fall toward, to fall as my wife and I fell yesterday toward coffee and a pleasant bookstore, as we fell this morning toward, in the local newspaper, a photograph of that bookstore, a photograph that must have been taken shortly before we arrived, that commemorates absence, that attends to everything not photographed, racks of magazines and books, crumbling adobe neighborhoods, memories swelling in the lilacs, flowing in the acequias, blood-spattered priests, jailed Pueblo leaders. I should there, that's a section about the um, Pueblo Revolt of 1680 in New Mexico in which the Pueblos revolted and killed a bunch of priests and then later the, uh, the, uh, his, the um, Hispanics 
came back, the Hispanic occupiers came back and, and punished them. But Okay, so flowing in the acequias, blood-spattered priests, jailed Pueblo leaders, cache of longing under the plaza grass, longing shaped into earrings and pottery, longing inscribed in racks of blankets, vested in theaters and galleries, scribbled in margins, entwined among arbors and portals. These Americans strolling the tax-sheltered streets of Santa Fe, what is the real name of this place? are a complex of occasions, are falling. And the photograph says, lovely. And the photograph says, here is the generous life upwelling. And the photograph says, it is time to write the diary of your days. Among the gathered blossoms, in the morning courtyard, in the casual isolation you want to call privacy. So why is it, is it an anti-war poem? That will be on the final, I guess. <laughs> War isn't as simple as we think. Okay. Um, I think we'll do a quick fashion report or something completely different. This will answer all your fashion questions. Uh, fashion report. Was it a shirt in or a shirt out age? No one knew for certain. It was clearly not a rolled pants era, though a few in isolated moments mistook it for one. It was not a blue eyes shadow and pink lipstick era, that seemed clear. White calf length boots, boots, no. Archie on with a chunk of fire hardened charcoal, no. Was it a straight flat hair epic? Or a soft fluffy curve around the edges of the face moment? Opinion on bangs or the vasty open sheen of the forehead was mixed. Even the experts seemed divided on whether it was the power stiletto or the innocent wonder of the flip-flop. <laughs> Could the two exist side by side? Editorials in the major periodicals suggested this was unlikely. And the CPO, the Nehru, the various vestments of oligarchy, Consigned, it would seem, to the thrift shops, but beginning again a secret assault from those bunkers. Was this a sign of discomfort with the wars or an embrace of the ranks and charges therein? A secret army of ragtag missionaries from the marijuana growing loft dwellers? Or simply a love of the smart epaulets, the slim effect elicited by the clean lines of the militaristic? Such, such questions were remanded to the authorities for further study. Experts were quite sure it was not a loose open collar and thick silver chain era, nor was it a button down era, though some pressed for such a shift. It seemed that it was neither the wide tie and suspenders of rising markets, nor a thin tied rejection of traditional monetary policy. Glasses were incoherent, reflecting a certain befuddlement among the populace. Was it a subtly ambitious and slightly ironic wire-rimmed moment? Or did this age call for the thick black rims of real politic? The electrical bridge, taped bridge of solidarity seemed entirely absent from the optic landscape. The recent outbreak of irony among t-shirt slogans introduced uncertainty into the market forecasts. Even the hairstyles, mixed as they were, from buzz cut to bouffant, proved unreliable as indicators. At parties, the frisson of off-the-grid patchouli mixed easily with upwardly mobile Chanel, scuttling all attempts to read consumer confidence. Were we approaching an age? Was the incoherence a sign? And why now this incoherence, this unseemly recklessness among the wearers of clothing? And why these snappy chapeaus when all the experts had predicted bare heads and baseball caps? Where were our vestments taking us? What would be the human cost? Okay. Right. Um, let's see. Preliminary report. Okay. This first poem is called Yodel, and um, it's not exactly about my father, but my father was like a famous yodeler in Naugatuck, Connecticut in, 19, in the 1940s. 
And uh, he was on the radio when he was 13 years old. He had a weekly show in which he apparently yodeled. <laughs> uh, I never actually heard him yodel because when he was like 19 years old, his voice changed and he could no longer yodel and so he refused to yodel. My daddy used to yodel. That's not all my daddy did. He'd wear plaid shorts and guinea tees. Grim in his swimsuit, he'd grip a bud and wade in the gloaming, glower in the grief of it. It being most everything, neighbor hovering over his single rose, moon in the lilacs, wheelless tricycle in the pachysandra, lovely wife and mother athwart the chaise lounge. My daddy used to yodel, late nights in the alley between this basement and the next, old lummox with a Gibson he'd strum and pluck until red flashing lights of radios hiss and crackle scuttled his heartfelt song. This world don't cotton to no yodeler, so grim and grimmer now my daddy is, knob knee deep in plaid and bud, his yodel stuffed, his Gibson packed, that lovely wife and mother gone, gone to glower, and grief and gloaming. Yeah. It's called Of the Merely Personal. And um, I think it's self-explanatory. It's, kind of, it's kind of the 60s. It's uh, something like my life in the 60s. Um, Janice and Jimmy are in, are in it. Or at least Jimmy. Oh yeah, Janice. Janice and Jimmy are both in it. Of the merely personal. Um, and it ends on a question, so if you're trying to learn something from this, apparently you won't. <laughs> of the merely personal. At 19, I wanted to pierce the skin of the world's complacency. I wanted to remind, for instance, my mother's uncle who slept on the couch in his painter's coveralls and flannel shirt, snoring so loudly we heard him in our upstairs bedroom, that we are all slipping easily and precipitously toward death. Because I was 19 and had heard Janice howl, heard Jimmy slipping the guitar's needles under the skin of the world. Heard him conjure a panic of fiery spears that he hurled into the Woodstock sky. Because that's what you do when you're 19. You think you have the miserable secret to everything and you're going to ruin the party, hold the dead kitten by the tail and wave it in everyone's face. But the party would ruin itself soon enough. And nothing would save you, not the ducks nuzzling the corn mash in your hand, not the peaceable kingdom of warblers that fluttered and flitted that spring before the darkness yawned, tired of waiting, and began swallowing everything you cared about. Because maybe nothing is personal, not the ducks nuzzling your hand, for the, not your mother under the covers giggling with a family friend who just slipped out of your younger brother's bed. Not your father who parked in the driveway, his breathing more like a flurry of gasps as he circled his hand over the cancer that would kill him six months later. Maybe the personal is always an expression of the cultural. Your father's cancer, the world's cancer. Your mother's giggling, the world laughing, saying, I had no idea, and so what? And those ducklings, those clumsy balls of yellow down, they were the world's clowns, the goofy mechanisms of their heads and bills, the thoroughness with which they prodded each fold and edge, sliding and nudging their blunt bills into the cracks between each finger until just a few yellow grains were left. And you opened your hand and shook them free. The dead kitten was a white Persian, blue-eyed, tail straight up as it strutted, somehow crushed under the loose cinder blocks piled by the back door. And the great uncle, 
He'd parked his 58 Buick under the maple and doze and smoke while we played drinking games and set back inside my grandmother's house. Sometimes he'd bring home an eel, curl it in a frying pan, saute it in butter, and eat it alone. We never asked him who he was or how he came to sit at his sister-in-law's table. We were probably passing a pipe or dealing a hand of setback when he died. Who did we think we were, reading Kerouac and blasting exile on Main Street as if they were the loose wires of the world hissing and sparking? As if we had only to walk out the front door and keep walking long enough and we'd find a meaningful world out there among the microbuses and head shops, among the posters, pipes, and papers, the mud and litter of festivals. Nights spent circling the green or standing under, under the flickering elms with ripple wine in our paper bags. Until one night, huddled at the top of the stairs, listening to the Beatles' White Album burst from the speakers on the scene of the unheard at two in the morning, the blue lights of the stereo glowing, some scavenged Hendrix poster by Peter Max glowing in the black light. It seemed we could feel the weight of moonlight falling on our shoulders, and we thought we were almost touching something real more real than the great uncle on the couch, more real than the shell-shocked father and his steady deathward plod, more real than our mother's willed obliviousness. We knew there were messages inside the messages, inside the messages, inside the music, and they had chosen us to tell themselves to. But what were they saying? And what would we do if we knew? In the 60s, there was this strange phenomenon. Like, you always felt like you're on the edge of something. There were new things all the time, and it always felt like the next thing will be the, you know, you'll be, you'll, you'll, you'll be enlightened. Alas, the 70s came, and I was still unenlightened. <laughs> yeah. Okay. A short, there's a lot of poems in this book about my daughter, Gracie. Um, in fact, I got... I had to like, be really selective about which poems I dedicated to her, or else every other poem would have been dedicated to her. Um, she's 24 now. This poem takes place when she was probably 12. Yeah, 12. And she, was, she wrote a horse called Codeman. Codeman was half thoroughbred, half Hanoverian. It was like the most athletic horse I've ever seen. Scary athletic. First time it walked out into the sunlight, it jumped like six feet straight off the ground with her on its back. And I knew we were in for a a long ride. We went to, she rode it for four years. When we went to sell it, her riding teacher said, the horse is unrideable. <laughs> I said, that would have been good information to have four years ago. Uh, but she survived it. She used to have to ride the horse straight into the barn wall to stop it uh, all the time. And it ran away with her run once and ran about a half a mile at a full gallop over cactus and rocks. Scariest day of my life. Um, and finally it just ran out of, it ran into a fence and had to stop. But anyway, she loved the horse as we'll see. Horse and Shadow. Cold the wind that rifts through the west end door sounding its low moan, grieving the moments passing, and cold the nose of the near black gelding, where he stomps once in the glistening darkness, the gentle night. My 12-year-old daughter, stiff in her jodhpurs and boots, removes one glove and reaches a carrot toward the shadowed head. Good boy, she purrs, good boy, good boy who had bucked and lurched, galloping hell-bent at the corrugated wall, whirling until he'd launched her from the saddle into the dust-dazzled air. Good boy, she says. And he is, furious teacher, unendurable bliss, because she says he is, loyal girl, good friend, forgiver, profferer of carrots, wielder of whips, tiny commander, in her wafer thin saddle. Okay. Um, it's called The Good Life. 
And it's, uh, I grew up in uh, the Italian section of New Haven. And then I lived in a place called Orange, Connecticut, which is full of Italians. And there was a time when I thought I actually was Italian. And I was really, it was really disappointing to discover that all those guys weren't my uncles. And <laughs> it was so different. I, was, I grew up in an English-Irish family. And you know, it was a noisy kitchen, but it just wasn't the same kind of welcome. So uh, it's called The Good Life. And it's a, basically a set of advice from a, uh, a mother to a son. Find yourself some good, honest work. That's what my mama said. Find some good, honest work. Do it for eight hours. Come home, eat some pasta, drink a glass of vino, put your feet up. When it comes to footwear, don't skimp. Buy good shoes with thick soles, rubber soles, not leather. Leather will make you slip and slide. Let the pimps wear the leather soles. You get a good solid shoe. A black shoe with a thick rubber sole, a low heel with laces, a slip on is a slip off. Don't take chances. Get good honest work. Buy good shoes and a stiff mattress. No feather beds for a working man. A hard working man needs a hard mattress. None of these water beds either, she said. You'll dream of the sea and a man dreaming of the sea is a dangerous man. Find yourself a woman with good legs and hips. A woman who can carry children and make a spicy sauce. Don't marry a thin woman. She'll move too fast and be restless in bed. She'll keep a working man awake and love shopping too much. <laughs> Find a woman who can grow pole beans, a woman who can lose herself in the good dirt, who can stake the tomatoes and knows how much basil makes a handful. Some women's hands can't hold a handful of basil. There's too much space between their fingers. Don't marry a woman with too much space between her fingers. That's what my mama said. Buy good shoes and a stiff mattress. Find a woman with good hips and strong legs. Keep the kids in the yard. Don't let them wander. Get a small dog with a big bark. Chain him out by the garden. You can't be too careful. Go to church every Sunday. Confess your sins. Make a good communion. Bring a plate of something sweet to the St. Anthony's bake sale. Keep the kids clean and out of the dirt. And don't let them run with the Dolcini girls. For God's sake, don't let them run with those skinny Dolcini girls. <laughs> I was going to say something about that. Yeah, I mean, I made up all the advice, so they're not like old Italian <laughs> or anything. Um, okay, this is called Utilitarianism. This is another poem for Gracie. Gracie was uh, three years old, I think. Yeah. Most of the time I tell you how old she is in the poem so, we can, so I can remember. Um, so utilitarianism is a philosophical system which gets explained in the, in the poem. And it's Salisbury, Maryland is where it takes place. <laughs> Salisbury morning stippled with flowers, azaleas flaring by the door, rhododendrons spor sporting their red boutonnieres, magnolias like huge pink artichokes, and birdsong, lisping warblers in the linwoods, the flickers ratcheting call, mockingbird on the chimney auctioning the moment. I tried to steer her, just three years old, past the robin, expert at noticing she walked straight to it. What happened to his head, she asked. Hit by a car, I said. She looked and looked, put hands on her knees as she leaned in to study the grizzled ruff of feathers, ants climbing the bent beak, diving into the eye sockets. Finally, she straightened. Oh well, she said. Around us, birdsong brilliant in the blossoming world. All the other birds have their heads. And uh, so this is the um, kind of the title poem of the book. If I can find it. Um, 
It's called Preliminary Report from the Committee on Appropriate Postures for the Suffering. And the first time I read this, I actually had my computer read it, and it seemed appropriate. But, um, but I, um, it would require a more elaborate sound system. Um, so, so this is a, it's a, it's a, it's can be a very, it's a kind of an anguishing poem to read out loud. I kind of dread it, cause it but it's, um, well, it's about committees and politics and suffering. Preliminary report from the Committee on Appropriate Postures for the Suffering. We who wear clean socks and shoes are tired of your barefoot complaining, your dusty footprints on our just cleaned rugs. Tired, too, of your endless ploys, the feigned amputations, the imaginary children you huddle with outside the malls, your rags and bottles, the inconvenient postures you assume, though we remain impressed by your emaciation and your hunger and, frankly, find you photogenic and think your images both alarming and aesthetically pleasing to do anything more than sigh will require a complex process of application and review, a process that is currently in the development stage. Meanwhile, may we suggest you moderate your public suffering at least until the Committee on Appropriate Postures for the Suffering is able to produce guidelines. Do not be alarmed. The committee has asked me to assure you that they are sensitive both to the aesthetic qualities of your suffering, the blank stares, the neotenous beauty as the flesh recedes and the eyes seem to grow larger, the halos of flies, and to the physical limitations of human endurance and the positioning of limbs. They will, I am certain, ask that you not lift your naked children like offerings to the gods, on this topic, discussion has centered around the unfair advantage such ploys give the parents of such children. The childless, whether by choice or fate, are left to wither silently in the doorways while those with children proffer and gesticulate in the avenues unabated. This offends our cherished sense of fairness, the democratic impulse that informs and energizes our discussions Therefore, we ask for restraint. And where restraint is lacking, we will legislate. Please be forewarned. In addition, the committee will recommend that the shouting of slogans, whether directed at governments or deities, be kept to a minimum. Not only is such shouting displeasing aesthetically, but it suggests there is something to be done. Believe me. No one is more acutely aware of your condition than we who must ignore it every day on our way to the Capitol. In this matter, we ask only that you become more aware of your fellow citizens who must juggle iPods, Blackberries, briefcases, and cell phones, lattes, who must march steadily or be trampled by the similarly burdened citizens immediately behind them. Your shouting and pointing does not serve you well. Those of us employed by the agency are sworn to oversee you. If we seem, as you suggest, to have overlooked you instead, that is an oversight and will be addressed, I am certain, in our annual review. Please be aware. To eliminate your poverty, your hunger, your aesthetically pleasing yet disturbing presence in our doorways, above our heating grates, in our sub subway tunnels, and under our freeways would mean the elimination of the agency itself and quite possibly a decline in tourism. Those of us employed by the agency have neither the stamina, persistence, nor the luminous skin tones that you present to the viewing public. Finally, to those who would re recommend programs, who would call for funding and action, I must remind you that we have been charged not with eliminating your suffering, but with managing it. Okay. One more poem and then I'm going to get my friend. Uh, this is called Passing. 
There's another poem that features my daughter. Um, and then there'll be a, like a short intermission while I um, get my friend passing. When he saw it was passing, when he stood in the doorway on an early June morning and really heard the birds, the finches chip, 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 cheery in the acacia, the quail pacing and swalking from the parapet, the song sparrow's waterfall trill from its juniper perch. When he watched the clouds pass over and watched new clouds arrive, when he saw the wind in the branches and swayed with them like the bittern in the marsh grass he watched once as a child, when images of his young daughter, now grown and living on the coast, began flickering at the edge of thought, when he felt the heaviness in his limbs and felt it passing, his answer was to write it down, to mark its passing by making it more permanent, the way the shale had taken the trilobite his ex-wife had found in Pennsylvania and replaced it grain by grain until there was nothing left of the original creature, only a beautiful, in intricate mold. Not the trilobite itself, not the creature, but a replica, a gathering that marked the trilobite's absence. The way each of his words marked the event, the object, the life that had passed into, into oblivion, the oblivion of memory which is worn by use, the edges, the beautiful glitter, the luster, the sharp definition of each ridge now gone, so that each memory is like the blurred photograph that marks the absence of the object photographed, that is an occasion therefore of speech, of story, so that you hold it up and say, that black speck was a whale, that blur above him, the water spout, so beautiful, and it was a cool spring morning and breezy, and I held you, you were wrapped in your little parka, and you wanted to ride him. You said, could you ride him? Could you touch him? Could you feed him, you said. And then the calf appeared along the sh alongside the ship, breaching and tumbling and clowning, and I set you down along the rail and held held the back of your coat while you laughed and startled each time he rose, stomping your feet. Then one big eye looked at you and, and you clapped. It was all passing and you laughed and clapped and looked up at me, dancing a little now from the middle of your almost unbearable joy. Thanks. Now I'll get my friend. Okay. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. That's the machinery here. That'll work. Well, I'm I'm Chuck Calabrese. And uh yeah, John asked me to bring some poems. I, I was at a writing conference and they said I could only read one page, so I got these. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read some poems. I made all these up, and uh, luckily there's, I'll, uh, I think I, this, how, this is a, a, a truth about poetry readings. It's not this reading, but it might have been the last one. Uh, but first I want to introduce myself uh, by reading a little poem. It's called Auto Hagiography. Anybody know what a hagiography is? You're smart. <laughs> Are you a saint? I'm trying to be. <laughs> Aren't we all? Really? After all. All right. So this is uh, Auto Hagi... Hi. Uh, it's called Auto Hagiography, and it's about me, <laughs> surprisingly. And uh, when I'm finished with this poem, I'll probably be asked to leave. <laughs> uh, okay, so you'll notice that every line begins Chuck Calabrese. That's because that's my name. <laughs> Chuck Calabrese is not getting his lands in order. 
He's not saying please and thank you. He's not excusing himself from the table. Chuck Calabrese is not thanking you for your patronage. Chuck Calabrese is, is not having a nice day. He's not working on himself. He's not taking one step at a time. He's not going slowly. He's not regarding others' feelings. He's promised to fuck you up and you and you. <laughs> He's refusing to mind his own business. He won't rise early and he's banging his head to rancid in total disregard of the lease he's signed till late at night. Chuck Calabrese will be late with the rent this month and next month and the next month after that. He doesn't feel much like answering the phone, so we... Chuck Calabrese is answering me. I'm not here. And if I was, I wouldn't answer anyway. So leave a message and I might call back if I feel like it. But don't hold your breath because I haven't felt like it in a long, long time. <laughs> oh, Chuck Calabrese is bouncing checks, checking 18 items in the 15 or fewer line. He's refusing to save and he's spending beyond his means. He's neither frugal nor thrifty nor wise. He's not praying for peace. He's not chanting in the arboretum. He's not recycling. His cholesterol is way out of line. He's not giving anything up. Chuck Calabrese does not mean well. He's not trying his best. He won't be patient. He won't act his age. He's drooling on the pillow and pissing on the seat. He drives in the passing lane, passes in the breakdown lane. He doesn't care whether bridges freeze before a road. Chuck Calabrese has refused to find the lowest cost long distance carrier. When he wants something, he shouts and shouts until he gets it. And when he gets it, he whines it is not exactly what he wanted. <laughs> Okay, we'll keep this brief. <laughs> Two more. And you'll see why that's significant in a minute. So this is the, the world's first, this is the, the archaeologist found the first authentic to-do list in the cave near Lascaux, it's France, right? You're smart, yeah. Um, and it's, so, so, so here's the to-do list, and the amazing thing about it, I mean, my to-do list, probably your to-do list, looks pretty much just like this. To do. This is 15,000 years old, by the way. <laughs> to do. One, wake up. <laughs> you, got, you all got that one, right? That was on your list. One, wake up. Two, grunt. Three, scratch. Four, light fire. Five, scratch wife. <laughs> Six, cook chunk of meat. <laughs> Seven, eat, eight, belch, nine, piss, ten, nap. <laughs> Eleven, sharpen spears. Twelve, paint stick figure deer on cave wall. <laughs> Thirteen, grope wife. Fourteen, nap. <laughs> Fifteen, hunt. Sixteen, kill deer. Seventeen, start a new fire. Eighteen, cook deer. Nineteen, eat deer. 20, throw extra log on fire. 21, grope wife. 22, sleep. <laughs> Nothing changes. <laughs> okay. The truth about poetry readings. You've been to them, right? You, you recently witnessed one. <laughs> it's time to tell the truth. The truth about poetry readings is none of us wants to be here. <laughs> the truth about poetry readings is we're getting 10 extra credit points. <laughs> the truth about poetry readings is your friend knows the poet and that's why you're here. <laughs> or your sister married the poet and you like your sister and you feel bad that she has to go on all these poetry readings and sit by herself. <laughs> Oh, the poet taught a wonderful workshop that you attended, and he's kind of famous, so you dragged your friend and sister to see him so they could see that you know a sort of famous poet who will probably say hello to you and maybe even remember your name. 
or coming to the poetry reading seems like something you ought to do, like going to the dentist or watching the History Channel <laughs> or practicing your instrument or calling your mother. <laughs> the truth about poetry readings is you can't wait for it to be over. <sighs> the truth about poetry reading is only the poet seems to be having any fun and you're not even sure about him. <laughs> The truth about poetry readings is you're hoping the poet doesn't start shuffling papers. <laughs> the truth about poetry readings, I'm just making this one up, is you're hoping the poet won't say, it would, be, would it be okay if I read for another 10 or 15 minutes? <laughs> because the answer is always yes. <laughs> and the real answer is always no. Please, no. <laughs> uh, well, now, see, I've, I've made something up, and now I'm really confused. <laughs> uh, the truth about poetry readings is you're hoping he doesn't say, the next poem is 45 pages long and is a modern retelling of the Odyssey. <laughs> the truth about poetry readings is you're trying very hard not to fall asleep. The truth about poetry readings is you're hoping there's food afterward, but you know there will only be chips and salsa and sparkling water or if you're really lucky, a vegetable platter with a plastic container of ranch dressing in the middle. <laughs> the truth about poetry readings is you lost track of the last poem after the second line, and no matter how hard you tried, you couldn't stop thinking about what you have to accomplish tomorrow. <laughs> The truth about poetry readings is sometimes you feel obligated to clap after every poem because everyone else is. <laughs> the truth about poetry readings is you think maybe you'll hear fewer poems that way. <laughs> <laughs> the truth about poetry readings is you're conflicted because you think if you clap after every poem, the poet still reads his one hour's worth of poems, well, you'll be here all night. <laughs> The truth about poetry readings is everybody knows why the poet always says, two more, so you can all relax knowing that the reading won't go on forever. <laughs> because you all know, but you won't say that you can't wait to get to the chips and the salsa and the sparkling water and the, and the, and the, and the, and the vegetable platter with the ranch dressing in the middle. <laughs> two more, because every poetry reading is approximately one hour too long. <laughs> The truth about poetry readings is you're really hoping, you were really hoping he'd say two more short ones. <laughs> the truth about poetry readings is you're here because you're a poet too and you know you'll eventually give a poetry reading and you're hoping the poet will see you at his so that he'll come to yours. <laughs> the truth about poetry readings is no one ever flicks her lighter and holds it up in the air at the end of the poetry reading or drives home with the top down, a bottle of beer between her legs, blasting the poet's poems on the CD player and reciting along. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And uh, John Davis thanks you too. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Do I know you? Don't you, don't you owe me money? You owe me money. He owes me money. Uh, checks in the mail. Yeah, I've heard that before. All right. Okay. You can all go now. <laughs> Two more. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> this, this, by, by the way, was the this is the Oregon version of Chuck. <laughs> he doesn't usually wear cam camouflage. <laughs> The next act. 